Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a conversation between an officer of the small claims tribunal and a consumer who wants to make a claim. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion, only the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good afternoon. How can I help you? Good afternoon. I'd like to lodge a claim. Certainly. Name? Emily Jane Appleby. Appleby. That's an unusual name. Sorry. What did you say your first name was again? Emily Jane. The woman gave her first name as Emily Jane, so Emily Jane has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Good afternoon. How can I help you? Good afternoon. I'd like to lodge a claim. Certainly. Name? Emily Jane Appleby. Appleby. That's an unusual name. Sorry. What did you say your first name was again? Emily Jane. Now, Miss Appleton, could you please fill in this claim form? I've never done that before. Can you help me? Yes, of course. The first part is for your. The claimant's details. Where do you live? Um, at One Yeronga Street, Durham. How do you spell Durham? D U R H A M. Of course, I should know that, but it's just one of those names that sounds quite different from the way you spell it. It is confusing. I've seen it spelt with two R's. And what's the postcode for Durham? Four one o five. Good. And do you work? No, not at the moment. Okay, so no work number. What about a home phone number? Yes, I can give you that. It's seven eight four eight three seven six two. Seven eight four eight three seven six two. Right. Now this part here is for the respondent's details. Who's the respondent? The individual person, company, or business that you're claiming against is the claim against a landlord, tenant, trader, or driver. Well, it's a company that sells home appliances. So that's trader then. Just a moment while I write that down. ABC Appliances, actually. Oh, now this part is really important. If the respondent is a company, you must have the company's full and correct name and registered address. I've looked it up on the internet, and it's ABC Appliances Limited. Good. If we don't get this part absolutely right, you won't have a legal claim. And their registered address? Yes, I've got that written down here. Just a minute. It's um, seventeen Brown Avenue. That's in Barden, isn't it? I think I know the place. My wife bought a vacuum cleaner there last month. Yes, Barden. Have you got the postcode for Barden? It's really similar to mine. Wait a moment. I'd better make sure I get it right. Four zero six five. That's it. And what's the telephone number for ABC Appliances? Oh, um, seven two three two four six eight one. Good. Got that. Now, in the third part of this form, we get to the actual goods or services that are in dispute. I assume you made a purchase from them. Yes, that's right. On the third of February, two thousand eleven. And did the goods have any sort of guarantee or warranty? Yes, but only for six months. So it was just a six-month warranty. 
Yes, they offered me an extended warranty for three years. But I would have had to pay extra for that. Oh, I see. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. You'll need to give a full description of the goods involved, the nature of the defect or fault, and any other relevant particulars. So, tell me, what did you buy? I bought a washing machine. Yes, but what brand, model, and serial number? The brand name was Mallard. And it was the Whisper model. Serial number, just a moment. I've got the warranty papers in my bag. Yes, here it is. Serial number XY303. Great. Now I need to know how much you agreed to pay. It cost a thousand pounds. Did you trade in your old machine? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. Okay. Now, what were you given for the trade-in? 250 pounds. So, in actual fact, the purchase price you agreed on was 750 pounds. That's right. And they delivered the goods two days later, on the 5th of March, and picked up the trade-in at the same time. Now, think carefully about this next question. What did the respondents say about the quality of the goods, or the way they would perform? The salesman who served me at the appliance shop said, the Mallet Whisper model has a much shorter cycle, so it uses less power. Oh, and he added, and it will also use less water. Is that true? Well, partly. It does seem to use less water, but both the wash cycle and the rinse cycle go on for much longer than my old machine, so I don't see how it can use less electricity. But the sales assistant also said, this model is whisper quiet. And is it? No, not at all. It's so noisy we can't hear the television in the next room. Excuse me, I have to answer that. Would you mind waiting? I'll get back to you in a minute. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a speech given by the head of a company to some new employees. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 16. First of all, a warm welcome to Barker's Country Safaris. We're delighted to have you all on board for this season. I know you've all been told a bit about the company when you had your job interview, but I thought it would be worth telling you a bit more about ourselves. Barker's was set up 10 years ago by myself, John, and my then girlfriend and now wife, Nancy. We started it initially just as a hobby, we felt that there was a good opportunity to share our love of the countryside in this part of the world with the many visitors who come here. As you know, most people come for the beaches in the summer, but there is so much more to the region, and this is what we wanted to exploit. Nancy and I were born near here, and as teenagers we went climbing, kayaking, white water rafting, potholing, and just straightforward walking. This district is in our blood, and we love it. 
While we were still at university, we started taking small groups of visitors out into the national park in Nancy's brother's old Land Rover. We'd drive them around the back lanes and into the forest. We'd also organize rock climbing tours for friends of friends. Then each year, without us having to advertise, people came back to us to ask for more excursions and trips. So, five years ago, we gave up our other jobs to focus full time on Barker's country safaris. Now, two years after that, we set up the activity tour part of the business, and one year ago, we expanded into organizing activities for school groups during term time. Obviously, this was a massive challenge with all the health and safety requirements, but it's proving a great success. You now have thirty seconds to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Anyway, we'll certainly not be dealing with school parties during the summer holidays. Our clients for the next three months are mostly family parties or groups of friends, and I'd like to talk a bit now about the tours we offer and what your responsibilities will be. Our most popular excursion is the Woodland Tour and Trail. Now, often this is sold out, and we have all of our ten jeeps and convoy with eight people in each jeep. It's a lot of fun. These tours really offer a taster of what we can provide. So, as both driver and guide, it is important that you do a good job here, so they come back for the bigger tours.、Uh, I will talk about the commission package later. As the summer days are so long, we have three tours each day, but you will not be expected to work on more than two of them. Morning tours start at eight a.m. and go to midday. Afternoon tours are from two p.m. to six p.m., and then evening ones seven p.m. to eleven p.m. All the tours follow the same route, and you should have made yourselves familiar with all the key information. This was provided to you in the information pack you were sent when you accepted the job offer. This is important, so if you haven't had time yet, please do so now. Our second most popular tour is the family exclusive. Now, this tour is for the whole day and for only one group. Usually, it is just one jeep, but sometimes there are two if the party is large. These tours go from 10 a.m. till 5 p.m. and include lunch at the Brown Bear in Lower Middleton. We have a number of different routes for these tours, as we don't want our premium clients being made to feel that they are part of a large package deal.、Uh, you will be told which route to take with your weekly schedule. Now, I'd like to move on to these specialty tour packages. These are the ones that we are keen to book people on once they've done the woodland tour and trail trip. Section three. Zoe goes to talk to her academic adviser. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to thirty. Now, listen carefully to the conversation between Zoe and her adviser, and answer questions twenty-one to thirty. How are you getting on, Zoe? Feeling at home yet?、Mm, well, more or less. There are still some things I need to buy, and I haven't found my way to all the facilities yet. But I really love the campus, and I've already made a few friends. 
Fantastic. Now let's see what we can do to get your studies off to the right start too. You're on the foundation course, so you can take up to eight modules. What we advise is that you take four modules in the first semester, and assuming everything goes well, four in the second. Have you decided which you want to take in this semester? I haven't made my mind up yet. I can't decide whether to take principles of marketing or introduction to international trade. Well, that depends on your career goal. You're planning to work in the biotechnology sector, aren't you? Uh, well, that's my present thinking, but I guess I might change my mind. Right. Well, marketing is a broad, general subject that you will find really useful in a number of careers. International trade, on the other hand, is more specific. That's fine if you're sure it's the sort of work you want to do. A lot of students start off thinking about that option because it seems glamorous, but marketing can also be an exciting career, and there's a wide choice of jobs. Maybe you ought to wait until your career ideas are a bit more definite before you go down that road. Yes, I see. I could take international trade next year, couldn't I? Sure, you could do international finance as well. So, in your first semester, you've got principles of marketing. Introduction to economics, banking, and finance, and let's see, principles of financial accounting. How do you feel about that as a package? It's okay, I think, but I'm a bit worried about the maths. There'll be some statistics to do, won't there? Basic statistics, yes, but nothing more difficult than your last year of school maths. I know, but our math syllabus was a bit old-fashioned. Mostly algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and stuff. Hardly any stats. Right. Well, it sounds as if you could do with the maths brush-up course. Can I arrange for you to attend just the classes on statistics, if you like? That'd be great. I didn't want to do the whole of maths again, but the stats classes would make me feel much more confident. Thanks. Hang on a minute. There's one more thing. Your English. Now you know you have to reach a satisfactory standard in English by the end of your first year to be allowed to go on to the main BSc course. Yeah, now I'm in an English-speaking environment, and I have to speak English all the time. I'm sure I'll be all right. It certainly helps, but speaking isn't everything. You'll have to get your reading up to the standards where you can understand the books on your course reading list quickly. To get the information and ideas, you need to write your essays. That means you have to develop a high level of comprehension skills. You'll never get through the course material if you try to read the books intensively from cover to cover. That's why our language skills development program gives you a series of graded academic texts to study and answer questions on a limited time. You'll probably find it hard at first, having to work against the clock without a dictionary. How can I improve my skimming and scanning skills? Good question. For that, you'll have to do a range of specially designed exercises. Sometimes these will be from a transparency because it is often how the lecture material is presented. Sometimes I think I'll never learn all the vocabulary. English is such an enormous language. I know what you mean. English is the biggest language ever. At least three hundred and fifty thousand words. Even Winston Churchill only knew sixty thousand, so they say. But as an academic student, you can get a lot of help from the academic word list by Avril Coxhead, of Victoria University. That's in Wellington, New Zealand. I've studied word lists, of course. But how does this one help? The academic word list is based on a survey of three and a half million words of academic text. It contains 570 families of the words most commonly found in academic texts. Well, that's apart from the 2,000 most useful words in English. They come in a separate list. You can see copies of both in the library. You said word families. Do you mean words that are similar? In a way, yes. It means that all the different grammatical forms of a word are listed together. So you can see the nouns, verbs, adjectives, forms with prefixes and suffixes, and so forth. It'll be clearer when you look at it. Anyway, Avril Coxhead gives you really great hints about how to learn the words, so it shouldn't be too daunting. The trouble is, I tend to forget the words I learn. Well, there are two ways you can tackle that. First, always try to learn the words in a context. Either learn a whole sentence using a word, or learn a phrase that the word typically comes in. We call phrases like that collocations. That's a new one on me. Collocations. I'd better make a note of it. You do that. 
you can find collocations in most modern dictionaries. Anyway, as I was saying, there's a second study aid I recommend for vocabulary learning. When you get an assignment, take a sheet of paper and write four headings. Words I can use, words I can recognize but can't use, words I'm not sure of, words I don't know. Don't bother with the simple words, of course. Then go back after two weeks and look at the list again. Can you move any of the words into a better column? That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. You will hear a woman talking about retail psychology. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty one to forty. Listen carefully to the talk, and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Hello, everyone. Let's get started on the final lecture in our module on retail psychology. Today, we're going to focus on supermarket layouts and how retailers display their products to encourage us as customers. To spend as much of our money as possible, it's an interesting topic. Now, most of us don't actually realize that the layout is deliberately designed to make us part with our money, but in fact, millions of pounds are spent on research into the psychology of shoppers and what motivates us to buy. So. Let's have a look at an actual supermarket layout. Now, here's the entrance to the store, just here. This area immediately around the entrance is what retailers refer to as the decompression zone or the dead zone. This is where the customers recover from the environment outside. And by that I mean this is where they adjust. For example, the place where they might put their keys in their pockets or take off their sunglasses. These kinds of things. So, what do you notice about this area? It's very empty, isn't it? Yes, it's pretty much clear of stock altogether. This area is not designed or used to sell us anything. Basically, the supermarkets never put any merchandise here because they know that no one's ready to buy yet. However, the retailers want their customers to feel comfortable. If they're in a relaxed state of mind, they're much more likely to stay longer and spend money. Now let's look back at the entrance again. Now it's interesting. But we know that three quarters of us look right, not left, when we go into a supermarket. So, seventy-five percent of people. This gives the supermarkets a great opportunity to hit us with promotions and offers. So, near the front door, you might also find what we call the dwell zone. The dwell zone. Is the area on the right-hand side by the front door, where you are encouraged to relax and browse. You will usually find newspapers and flowers here to help you do exactly that. 
Moving on from the dwell zone, we come to the power aisle. Basically, it's the main route customers return to after venturing into nearby aisles. And so this is the area of the supermarket where the strongest offers are displayed. So you might see a sign that reads barbecue time and you'll see all the items you could possibly need for a barbecue. The charcoal, the sauces, the skewers and the drinks. Everything you need all in one place. Were you planning a barbecue before you went shopping? Do you even have a garden? <laughs> yes, the power aisle has a very powerful effect on sales, even though most of us don't even realise we are being sold to here. Now, let's think about fruit and vegetables for a moment. They're always located towards the front. Now, why do you think this is? Yes, fruit and vegetables are always at the front because it gives the supermarket a healthy image. And let's think back to flowers and newspapers. We talked about both these items earlier. And yes, they're displayed near the front on the right. Now, they're known as distress goods. Why is that? Well, these are the goods that we often buy in a hurry or on impulse. In other words, these are the items we didn't actually intend to buy at all. But the supermarkets want us to put them in our trolleys even before we start our proper shopping. Now, what about everyday items like bread or milk or cereals? They're always placed right at the back of the supermarket. Yes, in this area here. Again, this is a deliberate strategy by the supermarkets. Basically, they want us to walk through the whole store to get them in the hope we will buy other things on the way. That's why items like these are often called destination goods. Now, where products are placed on the shelves makes a real difference. We read shelves a bit like we read a book. Our eyes go from left to right. And they want you to focus on the more expensive items, so they place them at eye level. It's often quite hard to spot items like cheap tinned food. Why is that? Well... They're normally placed very low on the shelves. Basically, the supermarkets don't want the cheapest products to be the ones you see first. Finally, let's have a look at the checkout area here. Now, we all know that sweets are deliberately placed within the reach of children at the checkout. But all kinds of things are displayed at checkouts these days. In fact, supermarkets can change what's on offer almost by the hour. It's a quick and easy way for them to rotate their stock. So, if the sun comes out, the checkout is an ideal place to display sunglasses. And if it rains, umbrellas can be placed there instead. Now, does anyone have any questions? That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.